Sure. Well, Tato, welcome along. I'll just wait for a few more people to roll in and uh, then I'll do some introductions. Good folks, just waiting for a few more to roll in and then we'll kick off. Thanks for joining us. Okay, everyone, let's, uh, let's kick off. Um, my name's Thomas Nash. I'm a regional councillor based in Wellington and a uh, member of the Green Party. And I'll be your host for tonight's webinar on transport and how we can use transport to make um, a good submission on the emissions reduction plan. Uh, I'm going to just uh, start off with a, a karakia uh, to open up the space. Me and my tata. Tutawa mai runga. Tutawa mai raro. Tutawa mai roto. Tutawa mai waho. Kia tau ai. Te mauri tu. Te mauri ora. Ki te katoa. Haumie huie. Tai ki e. Okay, well, kia ora everyone. Um, all right. So first uh, order of business for me is to introduce our two members of the parliament who will be talking us through uh, transport and how it relates to the emissions reduction plan. Uh, so we have Julianne Genta and uh, Tiano Tuiono. Um, I, I'm sure you both uh, know them well. Um, to uh, amazing uh, MPs, welcome along. And uh, yeah, so the the purpose of the of the of the webinar tonight really is to lay out a bit more about the emissions reduction plan and specifically how you can do a really good submission on the emissions reduction plan when it comes to transport, which is obviously a key area for reducing emissions. Um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We've done, this is the third edition of our webinars on emissions reduction plan submissions. We've done one on agriculture, we've done one on energy, and this is the third and final one on, uh, on transport. So with that, I will uh, pass it over to uh, Julianne Genta, former Associate Minister of Transport herself uh, and uh, former Minister of uh, Women, and now an MP uh, for the Greens based in Wellington. Uh, Julianne, over to you. Kia ora koutou. Great to see you. Thanks for emceeing, Thomas. And um, welcome to everyone who's joined this webinar. My name is Julianne Genter. I've been an MP for the Green Party for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years on the 26th of November which is also the day that my next baby is due. So I'm about to go on maternity leave for a few months, but um, I have been this term for the last year, the spokesperson for transport, infrastructure, energy, finance, urban development, building and construction, local government, and a few other things, COVID-19 response customs, state-owned enterprises. I think that covers it. But basically, I'm here to talk to you about transport. Before I became a politician, I was an urban and transportation planner. And I really focused on transport as one of the key ways that we shape the communities that we live in and the way that people move around, the way that goods are transported. Ultimately, you can't get away from transport if you want to create sustainable communities that are low carbon. 
And central government is hugely influential in New Zealand as to how transportation funding works and how local councils and local government are able to implement uh, their own transportation funding to provide public transport services or regional rail services, uh, walk, even walking and cycling. So it's a huge opportunity for us. And in the emissions reduction plan, the Greens have noted a few key things. And one of them is changing the way that we fund transport. We thought we did this four years ago in the government policy statement on transport funding, but I'm sorry to say it hasn't actually been implemented the way it was meant to be. Um, and we're, we're facing some challenges because Labour government has signed up to uh, billions of dollars on some stupid urban motorways that will not improve congestion uh, and will not reduce emissions. And we really need every dollar and every bit of our carbon budget that's left for the next few decades to be investing in the most transformational transportation infrastructure that enables people to get around our cities in low carbon ways. And that might be more public transport. So public transport operating costs are a huge factor. It might be safer walking and cycling and you know, in supporting the use of e-bikes and e-cargo bikes to replace some car trips and some van trips. Um, and it also means changing over our fleet to lower emissions vehicles where at least the government is making some progress on that. Um, but in the emissions reduction plan, we'll talk about we need to set a date for ending the importation of vehicles that are powered by fossil fuels. So that's my brief introduction. What a jelly. That's awesome. Uh, Te ano Tuiono is uh, a Green MP based in Palmerston North, which is my hometown uh, and a great place to live. Te ano is an expert in climate action, education, Indigenous rights, many other things. Uh, and we're very lucky to have him in the party. Over to you, Te ano. Uh, um, kia ora everyone, my name is Tiana Tuiono, one of your um, Green Party MPs. Um, I've got 10 other portfolios, just like all the other MPs as well. So I've got education, and I, I'm going to have to apologise, I might have to run down the house and do an education speech, but I know that you uh, want the best for the future of our children, so I hope you will forgive me if that comes up, so that might happen, I might just disappear. So education is one of them. Uh, Regional economic development, rural uh, rural communities, agriculture, biosecurity, oceans um, in the Pacific, so outside the EEZ. Um, uh, did I say agriculture? Uh, internal affairs. Uh, there's a, probably a, probably a bunch of other things. Oh, spies as well. I've got spies. So security and intelligence. Uh, I've, I've got those as well. Um, and so um, I've. Uh, I was on the um, agriculture um, ERP uh, webinar on, on the weekend as well, um, trying to get a sense for all of us about what that would mean from a green perspective, and encouraging people to to submit in, in that space, helping to helping um, our rural and farming communities to transition to organics and regenerative agriculture. That's that would be a, a really important piece within the emissions reductions plan as well. But I uh, I am also really interested in this space in terms of. Uh, what does it mean um, as a party that affirms and supports Te Tuiti of Waitangi uh, within, our, within our charter? What does that mean within the, within the transport context? Uh, and encourage people to sort of dig deeply into that and to, to find ways and to make suggestions where that is, where that is useful. Um, and, you know, I just recognise, uh, if you look back at colonisation with the Public Works Act and stuff like that, often those roads were just kind of powered right through Māori land and they use that act to take um, and indigenous people's lands. So we do not want to be re uh, repeating that. Instead, what we want to be doing is walking and walking alongside and supporting uh, our Māori communities, um, iwi, hapu, and whānau to do all the best that we can do to make sure that we transition to a low, uh, lower um, emissions future as well. Uh, but also, I'm out, in, I'm out in the rurals, I'm out in the provinces from the mighty city of Palmerston North, like Thomas as well. Um, so very interested to hear um, and to support submissions coming uh, from the provinces about what what all this means about reducing emissions um, uh, you know what does that mean for regional rail how, how that how does that look uh, differently for us um, as well I live in um, I live down some rural roads as well and making sure that uh, we we have the ability to have you know public transport active transport um, all of those other things that people you know in, in some ways might take for granted in urban cities well why can't we have those in the rural rural communities as well. Um, I know that's something that's, that a lot of parents think about when our kids are on the road waiting for the bus to come past, we've got all these trucks going past as well. If there were safer ways for our kids to, 
to, to you know, to use active transport, um, which would be good for them, good for their health, good for our communities, um, but also good for that low emissions future that we're all working and building towards. Thank you. Kia ora um, I could hear you pretty well there, but there uh, we are getting some feedback that maybe if you could get a little closer to your microphone, okay. that would be awesome. But you want all that again, do you? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, thank you, Tiano, and thank you, um, Julianne, for those. Uh, the next little bit is going to be me asking a few questions uh, of um, Julianne and Tiano to kind of lay out some, you know, background on the emissions reduction plan and the transport topic. But before I do, I just wanted to say on your point there, Tiano, about regional uh, this kind of regional um, context of transport. There was a great piece on TVNZ Q&A on Sunday morning with Nicola Patrick, who is a fellow regional councillor, but she's for the Horizons District, so Manawatu, uh, Wanganui. And yeah, she did it. It was a really great little segment that you can look up. Um, we can probably get the link up to that uh, for you about, you know, get, getting better public transport in the regions as well as our big cities. So yeah, kia ora kōrua. Um, I'm going to ask some questions now. Uh, and if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can pop them in there. We're monitoring that channel too. And we'll do our best to, to get through them all, as long as they're, you know, reasonable questions. Um, OK, so first question. And uh, you know, I'll, ask, I'll ask you both this. Um, why is the emissions reduction plan so important? Julie, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, firstly, what's out for consultation isn't the final plan that government's putting forward. It's some ideas and they're saying they want more ideas. So it's our job through this consultation process really to get as many people as possible to push for more effective policies, more action further and faster uh, so that the government does feel empowered, like it has social license to take meaningful action on climate change. And basically the ERPs set out under the Zero Carbon Act, and it means that every sector and every minister, which by the way is not Minister James Shaw, who's the Minister for Climate Change, but the Minister for Energy and Resources, the Minister for Forestry and Primary Industries, Agriculture, they've changed around the name, so I'm not sure what, they, what they're calling it right now, Minister of Transport, um, all those kind of key areas are responsible for setting out the policies and the plan that's going to lead us to um, scaling down our emissions so that we can actually achieve the budgets that were set out and proposed by the Climate Commission. Yeah, and um, um, what, probably what I could add to that is um, one of the things that we have been saying is that we need every minister to become a climate change minister. Um, and so uh, being really specific about how, what you think that means, say within, in this case, within, within the transport sphere is, is, is really important. Where you, where, you th where you think uh, things are falling short or where you think, think things uh, where we could ramp up the ambition. And I think we can all agree as Greens, what we want is the ambition ramped up as much as possible. Um, and, so, uh, and so I would encourage everybody to sort of to, to, to get into that detail and to really think about what that means in all the different contexts as well. I mean, I, I was going on about the, about the regional and provincial, but that's also really, really important as well because that's how goods, goods get, around the, get around the country. Um, and so, yeah, so I really encourage you all to, to, um, to get on the website and, and put a submission in. So is the, is the emissions reduction plan, I mean, what does it have, can it force emissions to come down? Like what, is, what are the actual mechanisms in there where, you know, if we, if we have this document and it comes out, like do ministers have to kind of lay out how they're actually going to reduce emissions and then does, does the country have to actually do it? Is that how it works? Yeah, I think that um, it's, it's really led by government. What are government policy levers that can help influence what's happening with emissions? So in some areas, government has direct levers like transport infrastructure. Um, you know, they're choosing what projects are built and that shapes our cities and how people can get around. But then there's other more indirect ways like through the clean car discount and clean car standard, which are policies I worked on last term that are now being implemented, that um, puts an incentive at the point of import 
for more low emissions vehicles to be imported. And that also helps influence, um, you know, choices from households and business who are buying new to New Zealand cars, which is admittedly not very many. <laughs> Most New Zealanders buy secondhand vehicles. Um, and then, and then, so basically government has a whole bunch of levers it can use to both influence how people are doing business, how they're living their lives. Building standards is another good example. Um, we can raise energy efficiency and reduce uh, electricity consumption by increasing and improving building standards. Uh, and government can do that even more directly by purchasing its own buildings to the higher standard, which then helps influence the market. Kia ora. So, um, okay, so so that so that makes sense. Uh, I guess I guess the the lever, like the public transport, that's a big lever as well, right? That that um, that the government could do is that is that going to be part of this emissions reduction plan? Yeah, uh, there's some reference to it in the consultation document, but I don't think there's sufficient focus on what is needed to get. Um, the type of level of public transport use as opposed to private vehicle use that we would need to really significantly reduce emissions. And unfortunately, um, it's interesting because we've just had a three-year national land transport program come out, which sort of states the government's intention for investment in transport for the next three years. And it definitely doesn't meet the level of ambition that would be needed for the emissions reduction plan. So, um, I think it's potentially the emissions reduction plan becomes a way for government to say, actually, we're going to have to go back and revisit. We've got this three year program, but we're going to have to rejig some of the investment and put a lot more money into public transport services if we're going to achieve this outcome that the Zero Carbon Act has said we need to achieve and also that we signed up to in the Paris Agreement. Okay, so that makes sense. Maybe we'll come back to some of the more specifics in terms of what what we should be putting into the emissions reduction plan on transport. If you know, if you if you two were in charge, but Tiano, you mentioned yeah how our existing roads and much of our transport infrastructure was sort of just rammed through um, over the top of um, indigenous rights and uh, hapu and iwi. What would a a model look like for scaling up our transport infrastructure? In Aotearoa, what would it look like if it was yeah. if it was meaningful? If it was based on tiatiriti? Um Well, the, the Climate Commission Change Commission has recommended that that Maori and government partner to create a strategy that responds to the particular experiences and uh, and needs of the Maori economy and, and Maori in general. Um, I mean, to me, that signals at least that they are aware of the history and the problematic problematic nature of the history as well. Uh, the Commission also recommended the development of Māori emission, emissions profiles as well. So the consultation is asking for feedback on how this would benefit Māori as well. Um, and so with with the Greens, we you know that is part of that's part of our part of our charter as well. And um, if you're Māori or if you're non-Māori, if you're Tangata Whenua or Tangata TDT, uh, there's also I think a, a responsibility for us as a party, whether you're Māori or non-Māori, to actually think about ways that would help to empower uh, Māori communities to make those things happen as well. Um, I mean, like the Public to Work Acts, uh, that did happen at the turn of the century, but it kept going. Um, there was, uh, you know, these recent cases of people, uh, you know, uh, them trying to put roads through, through Māori land. And, you know, that's, that's, just, that's just not the one. So making sure that we have some structure in place to make sure that that happens um, is really, really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the consultation document on the development of the emissions reductions plans that proposes a range of short term measures and long term strategies. Um, but again, the thing is, it has to be done in partnership uh, with Māori and that can mean different things in different places. I mean, I know, I know we were talking earlier about uh, Nicola with Horizons, there's a large number of different iwi there as well. So that strategy would mean, well, what does that mean uh, when you're dealing with a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, diversity of iwi and the how, how do you work in all the different perspectives as opposed to if you're in a particular area where there is only one iwi um, that you can partner up, which makes makes those sorts of questions a, a lot easier. So I would ask people to think about it from uh, when they make submissions to think about it from that very location specific thing because it can be it can be very, very different regard, uh, um, depending on where you are. If you're living in the provinces, it's different. If you're living in an urban setting, um, that it's different. But the principle is still the same principle. And that is that principle of partnership with Māori and making sure that we do the right thing by the Te Tūtia Waitangi. 
I want to ask uh, about Kia Tiana. I want to ask about, um, just on the back of that in a way, just about the kind of climate justice aspects to the transition from our current transport systems to our future kind of climate safe transport systems. I mean, that's going to involve quite a lot of change. It's going to, it's going to mean that we don't necessarily rely on cars as much. Car parking is yeah. going to be different. There might be congestion charges, things like this. How do we make sure that we've got a strong climate justice lens um, not in, in our submissions on this emissions reduction plan around transport, but just in general in our transport policy? Um, but I, I mean, I, I would say you I mean, would have to, I mean, like we've got transport, we've got agriculture, we've got energy, we've got all these things compartmentalised, but as Greens, we take a holistic view. So what is our, what is our green vision? What is climate justice and what does social justice means, means to us? And then what is the transport slice of, uh, slice of that? Um, you know, so that's, that's, that you know, just transition is about how do you support workers moving from um, in, uh, highly emitting industries to low emissions um, industries. What, is, what does that mean? Um, how do we do that in a way that supports uh, tangata whenua? What, how do we do that that supports, um, that supports workers? Um, and then what does that mean when you, when you look at that from, from the perspective of you know, the transport industry? It's, uh, you know, because uh, as much as we don't like roads, those are jobs. So when we transition, and we need to transition, what does that mean in terms of the, the work that is then available for those people as well? And I think we can do all the things. I think we can support and do the things if we have that holistic view and then put some of those strategies um, in place. So I do like the, the fact that there has been calls for uh, the partnership with Māori, um, looking at those short-term strategies. Uh, but, you know, the Greens, we are about that. We are about that long long game it's not just about locking into the election cycle it's about well this is this is this is what we got to do and we are in the case of climate change with a very very compacted time frame um, outside of the electoral electoral cycle as well so what does it mean when we try to do all these different things as well so i think it does uh, involve a, com a conversation with with the unions um uh, but then also with uh, uh hapu and iwi as well you want to turn it Julianne, do you want to comment on that climate justice point as well? And then maybe also, if you've got some specific things that you'd put in, if you were writing the emissions reduction plan uh, on your own, uh, maybe maybe lay out a few of those. Well, I, I mean, I think the climate justice lens is really important, but mostly it's a win-win because the car dependent, highly car dependent transportation system we have is very expensive and regressive because in order to access anything, you mainly need to own a car, which is really expensive and it takes up a much larger share of low incomes, low income people's income to just to get around, to get to work, to get to school, to get to see friends. Um, and so by making the transport system more people oriented, we actually have an opportunity to improve access, to improve access for people who can't afford to drive or who don't drive due to disability or who don't drive due to age because young people and sometimes much older people uh, can't actually drive and that reduces their, their sort of freedom to move around to not have quality comprehensive public transport services or safe uh, parts of the roadway that are protected from vehicles that can be used by lower powered uh, vehicles like electric bikes. Whoa, I don't know what happened to my camera. There we go. Um, so, um, so like there's a good news story in this, which is, you know, this should tick all the boxes, better for air quality, better for water quality, better use of land, more affordable, more um, equal. And, and interestingly, we know that when, you know, people use, the bus or the train and public transport, they're also more connected to the community and less sort of isolated. And it actually leads people to be less, um, well, to be more um, inclusive in their political views. It's really interesting, like car use and car dependent suburbs have been very um, atomizing and, and kind of split people off from other members of the community in a way that isn't really great for social cohesion. So, so th that's all the good stuff. So, so where do we start? I mean, mostly it's not that we have to force people to do anything different. We actually need government to do something different, uh, central and local government, um, and, and mainly central government, <laughs> because local government 
you know, often wants to do the right things, but they don't have the levers because the transport budget is so centralized. So, uh, you know, if we just put all of the new capital investment that we're putting into transport projects now into low carbon options and, and reallocated road space a bit. So actually gave buses priority, um, you know, put in cycleways. It doesn't have to be super expensive to put in effective protective cy protected cycle lanes. They can be um, planter boxes and paint can actually be great temporary protected cycleways. Um, and just doing those things can make it easier for more people to not have to rely on the car. And then that sort of immediately is a benefit. And then over time, where we're building new housing needs to be in locations where people can easily get to schools, health services, shops, uh, green space with, you know, within a short distance um, and using those more energy efficient modes of transport. So if we just design it right from the beginning, it actually makes it really easy. And we used to, like so many of New Zealand cities developed around electrified tramways at the turn of the 20th century. If we could do it then, we could do it now. I'm so I remember those tramways. <laughs> um, and we had passenger rail. We, you know, we had pretty comprehensive ferries and passenger rail and it was all connected up. And it was just basically a mistake from the 1950s to copy the Californian traffic engineers because what happened in the second half of the 20th century in the US and New Zealand had a real economic driver, uh, which was that, you know, American states were producing, you know, oil and they were making cars and making tires. And so there was this kind of like political economy associated with designing everything around cars and selling more cars. But in New Zealand, we don't produce our own oil. We don't make our own tires and cars. We import it all. So we kind of got, didn't get any of the, any of the benefit. <laughs> and Tiano mentioned people building roads. Interestingly, um, building big motorways creates way fewer jobs per dollar spent than almost any other investment you could think of. I mean, it's basically a million dollars a job now because motorways are mainly, the cost to them is buying land, using machines, uh, big machines. So th it's not a jobs rich investment. It actually running more public transport services would create many more jobs. <laughs> Even designing and building cycleways uh, creates more jobs or doing road maintenance, which is something that we do need to do for our existing roads. So um, yeah, it's really just about government reprioritizing the transport budget and then enabling local government. And I saw uh, local board chair, Julie Ferry asked a question. I'll just refer to that. You know, how can, how can local government empower uh, their constituents in this um, submissions process? And I think one thing we probably should be advocating for is more devolution of these transport decisions to a local level. Um, and less centralization through central government because the centralization has really been driven by, um, has led to a real focus on large projects. And it's not always big expensive projects that are going to get the best outcome from a low emissions transport point of view. And right now, you know, so the, the big projects was driven by national and the roads of national significance. And that's still sort of dominating the NZTA Wakako Tahi agenda. Um, but even when it comes to um, big investment in rapid transit, you know, if you look at Let's Get Really Moving, the consultations come out in the last few weeks, or Auckland Light Rail, um, arguably the most climate friendly options are also the least expensive options because they don't involve massive tunneling and building stations underground or building new roads underground. Um, and we need more of those cost-effective solutions, which isn't to say, you know, that we don't invest in rail. I think rail has a huge role to play in, because it's so energy efficient, shapes land use, um, and it has such a long life. Um, you know, everyone's like, oh, just do it with buses. You, you can't do with buses what you can do with rail. And if we need to be investing now for low carbon options 100 years from now, rail makes a lot of sense. 
um, but maybe not going for the underground super flash tunneled option, but rather the more surface light rail reallocating road space. Uh, I'm on so, board. I just want to, I just, you know, there's one, there's one train from Parmian at least, at least so early in, early in the morning. So even just kind of like doubling and tripling the train services would be a step in the right direction. But we definitely need something to actually connect these these, you know, these, these smaller regional areas. And I think that will take a lot of cars off the road, which is a good thing. And then you could use that money to, to do all the things that, that we, we need to do as well. So that our, our, our rural communities and our provincial communities can get out on the roads. We know that our kids are gonna be okay because we'll actually prioritize active transport. Yeah. And combining, it doesn't have to be bikes. You know, we talk about bikes, but bikes is such a, you know, people think, road cyclist training, wearing Lycra, that is not the kind of utility cycling I'm talking about. I'm talking about my electric cargo bike <laughs> that can seat three kids in the front and carry a full load of groceries and takes up almost no room parking, even though it's, you know, it's bigger than a normal bike, but it's still really small compared to a car. Um, incredibly practical uh, and, and really cost effective. And the, to, when you combine that sort of thing for the last mile with, uh, you know, public transport that can take you, so you combine trains and bikes, you suddenly massively increase the number of people who can access both. If you see what I mean, like you can get much further if you can combine a bike and a train. Um, and maybe it's not a bike, you know, maybe it's a mobility device. Uh, maybe it's um, a scooter, but um there's lots of different options coming on the scene and they're almost all way more cost effective than one person in a brand new electric car, which is not to say that electric cars are not gonna play a role, but um, it, you know, they don't have, they, they're not the switching out every private car we have now for an electric car is not an option. Uh, it's not affordable. It's not um, gonna solve our congestion problems and, uh, and, and definitely electric cars or low emissions, zero emissions cars are gonna play a role, but uh, potentially it's gonna be more through car share, shared ownership schemes, things that give people access to the EV when they use it and they only have to pay for it when they use it. And the rest of the time they have a really affordable, efficient public transport service and streets that are amenable to walking, cycling, scooting, or whatever it is, mobility devices, wheelchairs. Kia ora, kia ora, Julie, kia ora, Tiano. There's some great material in there. I'm sure people are sharpening up their pencils, getting ready for their um, submissions to the emissions reduction plan as we speak. So um, I just have one question, one last little final question, quick one. And then I've got a bunch of questions that I'm going to try and get through from uh, participants uh, online. And thank you all for your questions. So we'll see if we can get through um, most of them. My, my, my last question, it kind of relates to the climate justice point and uh, the transition. And it's around the campaign that is a prominent campaign at the moment, free fares uh, for under 25s and um, people who have a community services card uh, and um, full-time and part-time students. And this is kind of seen as a, you know, it's a transport equity, it's a climate justice, it's an emissions reduction mode shift policy, it's being promoted, it could be promoted through the emissions reduction plan. What do we think about that? I mean, it sounds good to me. Totally, yeah. I mean, with one caveat, which is just that um, I totally think we need to reduce fares and having free fares for certain uh, groups makes perfect sense. Um, we just need to make sure we're also increasing services because there's no benefit to offering people free fares if they don't, if the bus is once an hour and it doesn't yeah, work for them. Yeah. So I, we, we need to do both and dropping fares and increasing services is something that absolutely should be a major focus of the transport budget and the emissions reduction plan. Yeah. Okay, Kapai. Um, I would also say on that, that ideally the funding for public transport from my perspective as a regional councillor, it may not surprise you to hear I don't think it should come from council rates predominantly. I think it'd be better to be shared uh, across all of the people in New Zealand as a as mainly a central government cost, which it is actually done in most countries that have really successful, really equitable um, public transport systems. Um, okay, so uh, thank you both for those um, comments and for answering my questions. Now I'm gonna go through some, some questions that have come through. 
in a slightly random order, um, but I might try and combine some of them that relate to each other. Uh, so first of all, um, this one that's dear to my heart. This is from Prue, subsidized e-bikes, like a kind of commuter bike. Is that a policy that we could, um, what do we think about that? Yeah, yeah, um, I think that that's really important. If there's a couple of things I'd say about the design. One, you wanna make sure that this is bikes that are for transport or utility cycling as we call it, which is not mountain biking and not, um, you know, racing. I guess if you're racing, you probably don't want an electric bike, but um, there's $10,000 electric mountain bikes, which are not very practical for transport. And so I think making sure that they're utility bikes with, in New Zealand, you need mud guards, good to have integrated lights, and you definitely want a rack either on the front or a pannier rack or both. Um, and probably for the bikes that are rated to carry our heavier weights, like um, cargo bikes that can carry goods or passengers, those are more expensive up front, but those are the ones that are more likely even to replace car journeys. And so it probably is justifiable to have a larger subsidy for those. Um, would love to see it apply to not just personal ownership, but maybe more shared ownership schemes like bike subscription services or bike shares so people can access it without having to commit to, to buying or even just having government um, smooth the kind of payments for it. So we tried to do this last term through um, uh, promoting government, like um, employer employers kind of providing a program through which employees could access um, electric bikes with a discount and the employer could provide the upfront cost so that you're just paying it back over a year or two, which is much more manageable for some people. Um, and, but I think doing that on a larger scale would be great. Is that, is that the I, answer you wanted, Thomas? That's great, yeah. I mean, I, I also kind of think, well, you know, this is just my, my feeling, but I reckon it'd be better to, yeah, in a way, because you could just like subsidize the cost of the e-bike up front, like the government is doing with cars, but I kind of almost feel like it, maybe a monthly subscription or like, a, you know, might be might be another model, which would be cool. But yeah, anyway, um, what about, so a couple of road, roading type questions. Um, a couple of people have asked about reducing the speed limit on the open road to 80K and reducing the speed limit in towns down to 40K. Um, thoughts on that, either of you? Uh, I don't have any research, but as a parent, I would like that. <laughs> like, yeah, I have no, no, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, even out on, uh, out, on the, out on the rural roads, it's, you know, kids are coming out to catch the bus to school and, you know, it's a busy road, right? If you're in one of those rural roads and your truck's going past 100 kilometers an hour and um, it needs to be as, as safe as possible. And sometimes with these, because um, I get a lot of, you know, a lot of trucking, um, you know, uh, milk trucks and logging trucks and all that kind of stuff as well and it and it switches down quite quickly so you go from 100 to 50 really quickly whilst if you had you know like uh if you, if you kind of went down a lot quicker and went from 80 to 40 um that would that would like ease the ease the anxiety i think for a lot of parents living in those areas certainly for me anyway but i have no research in Julian probably does. <laughs> the um, I was just going to say that the speed stuff's kind of happening through the road to zero, but I think it's really useful and important to make the point about the impact on carbon emissions because, for example, um, many roads in New Zealand are simply not designed to carry 100 kilometers an hour. And that will get reflected through the road to zero road safety strategy and action plan. And so they might get dropped to 90 or 80 or 70. Um, around schools, the default speed will be uh, 30 kilometers an hour around urban schools, but it will take about some years for that to roll out and it will require some redesign in urban schools. And then for rural schools, I think they ended up with 60 kilometers an hour um as the default speed um but no but like i think we do really need to Im reiterate the link between speed and emissions i mean at least until yeah. we have zero emissions vehicles um it costs more so like you, you could have a road like the waikato expressway that's designed to carry really high speeds but it's worth noting that even if it's safer um it's still gonna cost, it's gonna take more fuel and it's gonna result in more emissions. And I think that sort of information needs to be communicated to people. Yeah. 
No, I was, I was thinking if, like, if, the, if you slow down your car and smell the daisies, that's better for the community. Totally, I'm, yeah. I'm and the right. like obsession with um, speed and quickness of travel is sort of taken as a like a given. Like, oh well, people will get frustrated if they have to drive slow, so we, we shouldn't. You know, actually, many people feel more comfortable driving at an appropriate speed, and it doesn't make that big a difference to your overall journey time. Um, I mean, I noticed that I've started feeling a lot more comfortable driving on New Zealand roads when I just set the, um, you know, the uh, cruise control to like 80 <laughs> on some of those rural roads where the speed limit's 100. But, you know, it only adds a few minutes to your overall journey and you arrive so much more refreshed because you aren't um, concentrating like you're a race car driver the entire time. <laughs> well, for that, yeah, I'm, a, I'm quite a slow driver. When I drive, um, questions about some questions about interregional transport. So, Paul Callister, shout out to you and all your work on this. Um, much respect. Um, what do we? How, uh, how can we like revamp the interregional transport, public transport, which is really not that it's not that good. I mean, unless you're flying in a plane, which isn't really always feasible from a climate perspective. Um, so, some questions about that. Interregional rail, I know we've done some work on that um, before. And then your link to that, Adam's asked about electrification of the North Island main trunk line. So the remaining portions um, south of Palmerston North and um, uh, north of Hamilton. What do we think about that? And, um, you know, there's this question about battery trains uh, that might be able to do some of that uh, instead of or in combination with electrification. That's quite a technical question that I have a view on, but um, I'm going to kick it over to you. Well, I mean, I like the regional. I mean, I like the regional rail um, idea, connecting Palmy to Wellington, Palmy to Marston, and Palmy. Oh, I'm just talking about my own town. Shame on me. But also, what that means uh, right across uh, all, all the other towns and cities as well. Uh, I, I think people will will, will, will take it up, um, and it will take people. It will take uh, um, it will take cars cars off the road. Uh, and from what I understand, it's a, it just it's just a lot cheaper than building a bunch of roads. So I mean, I, I would I would encourage people to put put that in their in their submission as well. I don't know anything about batteries. Maybe maybe um Thomas or, or Julian, you can comment on the battery question. But I'm definitely a, big, a fan of the the regional rail idea. Julian, yeah, I I mean. I just think there's huge potential and the Greens have been campaigning on this for a while, but we haven't seen any government action in this direction. Like there's just the most minimal, luckily in greater Wellington region and um, horizons, they have a plan to increase the capital connection services. And we managed to get funding for that um, in the New Zealand upgrade program, not for the services, but for the uh, track upgrades that are needed to support increased services. So that's in the pipeline. And then there's, the Hamilton to Auckland rail service, but the way that's been rolled out as a pilot is kind of disappointing because it's really not enough frequency or speed to really make it attractive to get growing patronage. Um, but uh, we, we need a step change in investment and that's where it's really, really useful. I think if people can um, put that in their submissions on the ERP that we need a step change in investment in regional passenger services. In some places where we have an existing rail line, it makes sense to upgrade that and run rail services. Where we don't, uh, we should be running a kind of national intercity passenger uh, bus service with um, a goal other than profit, because you know we saw quite quickly when the borders closed that um, in a COVID situation, uh, a lot of those intercity bus services are not really viable, but they're also kind of not designed because they're run by, you know, private companies who are just looking to kind of maximize bang for buck. They kind of aren't pitched at um, really enabling access around the country and doing so in a way that is comfortable and convenient. So I, I think we could do much better with our intercity passenger services. Um, and that's something that government should be taking responsibility for and not just leaving to the private market. Jorda, there's a great map uh, that has been done of intercity regional rail uh, that could be done. I think it was like 10 billion that it was going to be uh, and it would get hugely, um, yeah, hugely improved um, services. 
um, through the country. Um, so I've got some questions now. Uh, I just want to think about this. Uh, there's a question from um, Daniel Marks around public transport staff and the living wage. And uh, you know, this is this is a key point, isn't it, around uh, making sure we can recruit and retrain the yeah. the workers for for this area. Oh, we support a living wage. I mean, and um, you know, livable livable incomes. Um, and I mean, that should be true now um, when we're in the situation that we're in, and it should be true when we transition to a low low emission economy, a low emission society, if you like. So, yeah, I definitely support that. There's another area in which um, what we're proposing, I think, would help, which is, I mean, obviously, living wage um, should be like a that's non-negotiable, um, but also, and that will help attract more drivers, so you don't get the problem they have in Wellington, where a lot of services have been cancelled because they had a driver shortage, um, and that that means changing how we contract services or even how we own the operation of the services, like allowing public ownership. The Greens have a um, petition out on that um, and we submitted on the public transport operating model review saying that we should um, definitely allow public ownership of buses and depots or vehicles and depots, but also that we should enable um, public operations because right now two of our biggest bus companies have been sold to overseas private equity firms. Hard to imagine that they've got an incentive to run a really quality service um, and the know-how how to do that when really they're just about, um, you know, trying to get the best return on their investment. So it, it's just, it's kind of a crazy situation and it's it's one that we need to kind of unpick the neoliberal um, revolution that led to this situation. But the other, the other thing is um, all day frequency. The way you make public transport really accessible and effective is having all day frequency and on the weekends. And that really starts to make it an alternative um, to a private car. And, and when you have greater all day frequencies, you're still gonna have a peak, but you can get um, much better shifts for drivers. And so you don't have this issue where people are having to work split shifts. Um, so it's better for the passengers and it's better for the drivers and it's better for the climate. One quarter for that, yeah. I mean, one thing we've been noticing in in Wellington is that the living wage is definitely not enough, actually, to to recruit and retain um, bus drivers, and it's, it's and it's actually too low, really, for to reflect the the skill and the quality of the job. And we can't compete at the moment with truck drivers. They're getting you know twenty seven, twenty eight dollars an hour, and that's more than our bus drivers getting. So our bus drivers are you know leaving to do that. So we actually need to get. I think we need a, a national level uh, award, like a, a national kind of pay fair pay and conditions agreement for bus drivers, um, to make sure we can we can recruit and retain them. Yeah, the FPAs are kicking on next year. Right? I'm, I'm not too sure whether the, whether you know that's that's on the list, but I mean it'll be something definitely something we should be pushing for to support. Yeah. yeah. So I want to ask you a couple of questions now about um, the yeah the almost the framing of transport consideration and uh, the way it's the way it sort of exists in the public consciousness. So Alex has has asked about whether we could get a, a kind of public health framing around the transport transition, um, and um, Terry's asked a little bit about the kind of existing advertising that's out there that really pushes these big kind of macho trucks and utes and everything and whether there's chance to to get some more public education and messaging around more healthy more you know climate safe more more equitable and fair modes of transport what do we think about those kind of questions of transport in the public consciousness and how we can change them yeah yeah i think that's worth submitting on as well um and we've Certainly, see, I mean, I certainly don't see any reason why we wouldn't regulate or severely restrict the advertising of high emissions vehicles. Um, to me, that's a no brainer, but, uh, you know, I, I've raised it with the Climate Commission chair, Rod Carr, and he was, you know, oh. I mean, wh why, why not? If you can still buy them, but why should car companies be spending, you know, God knows how many millions advertising them and in a way that is actually 
completely not about their practical utility, but is all about lifestyle and trying to make them more sexy. Um, that's totally counterproductive to what we're trying to do with our car, our climate policies. And a there was a um, law passed in France, I believe it was passed. It was re definitely recommended by a citizens assembly and it was all about um, climate action. And one of their recommendations that I believe was passed into law was banning um, the advertising of high emissions vehicles uh, from like next year. And what they consider high emissions vehicles, frankly, is <laughs> still be relatively low emission here in New Zealand because they've had a fee bait for 20 years and their highest fee on polluting vehicles is $60,000, not um, five or whatever ours is. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I think I definitely think, and, and I do think that the government needs overarching messaging on climate because it makes it really, really hard to implement the changes that local councils are trying to implement to reallocate road space to make streets more people fr friendly and people oriented to put in place uh, bus priority and safe separated cycleways. It's really hard for them to do that on a bit by bit basis when nobody is connecting these little changes to the bigger picture. So people can think I want climate action and still be like, don't take away that one car park on that one street so that kids can actually cycle safely in this neighborhood and people could actually maybe use an e-bike as meaningful choice to get around. Um, so I, I think we do need a massive kind of public health style campaign around climate that helps people understand how each of these steps is linked to the climate friendly future we want. And I think that needs to be put into the ERP submissions because I don't I don't think government is sufficiently focused on it right now. Sure. Um, we are running with time flies when you're having fun. We are running getting close to the ending time. Uh, but I do want to ask um, a, a, a question about aviation. A few people have asked about this. Obviously, in, in our country, it's a big um, it's a big part of getting around for lots of people. Well, for some people. Um, and yeah, what can we do about that? Um, thoughts on reducing aviation emissions. Well, uh, regional rapid rail would help um, having some alternative or ferries, some alternative to flying to get around New Zealand. Um, and then, you know, there are electric planes. Um, I believe Sounds Air has actually purchased one. They're quite small, um, but they might be useful for some types of regional flights that can't, that, that'll be quite useful for New Zealand. Um, I've tended to focus on land transport just because land transport is like over 90% of our emissions. And the majority of that is light vehicles and just people getting around town every day, going five kilometers or whatever to drop the kids at school and get to work and go to the shops. And it seems to me those are the easy ones to replace with alternate, you know, low emissions alternatives. Um, it would be fantastic if we could see some real developments in pricing um, international aviation so that there's viable alternatives like very low emission or zero emissions passenger ships. I, I, I do think that could be a, um, a viable alternative in the future, but until we have some sort of incentive to move away from planes, um, you know, and, and, I, and I suspect that that will turn out to be, I, I don't know for sure, like whether we're gonna get long haul jet fuel that's zero emissions first, or whether we're going to get really efficient zero emissions passenger ships that can offer a quality experience to people so that they, they're they willing to take um, extra time to travel somewhere if they're gonna travel. And, and the reality is that in, in the future, we will probably travel less than we have become accustomed to in the 20th, late 20th century. Um, and COVID is probably uh, just the beginning of that. Well, uh, um, I'm going to have to go to closing closing comments now because we've um, we've exhausted most of our time. But there's oh, mate, there's so many cool things to to think about, and I hope you're all uh, feeling amped to do a submission on the emissions reduction plan before next Wednesday when they are due. Um, okay, so Tiano, you haven't had to run down to do your speech yet, so that's good uh, news. 
yeah, it, you, has, it has started, so I will have to run pretty soon. <laughs> okay, well, you just um, maybe maybe a couple of remarks just to just to close off, and then we'll we'll um, close off. Yeah, I mean, like all, all of the comments and all the questions I've been sort of capturing them on the right here and, and the chatter are, are, are great. Um, and so, what I would encourage you to do is take that, take those suggestions, uh, especially those really location-specific suggestions, and put them into your uh, put them into your submission. Um, you can do that through the website, or you can do it through the through the, um, the Green Party website as well. Um, yeah, so take all of that energy, put it in there. We really need you to. We really need your feedback. Um, Climate change commission, we need your feedback, and as a green movement, we need that as well. So, Kilda. Kilda Tiano, so you can you can jump off whenever you need to go. We we thank you for your uh, yeah, you. time. You actually do need to go. Yeah. Hey, yes. Um, thank you. That's brilliant timing. Um, Julie, do you have uh, Julian? Do you have any comments you'd like you'd like to make just in in closing, and then I'll do a little wrap up and then close us off with a cut here. Oh, well, firstly, I'm really sorry we haven't been able to get to all the questions in the chat, and I hope uh, it's not because I was talking too much about things you already knew, but um, there's a lot of really get really great questions and comments in the chat, and I just want to thank you for your participation, for turning tuning in, uh, for caring, and for submitting on the emissions reduction plan. Um, I think that this is an area where we're actually getting quite close to really positive change and we just need to keep pushing and pushing. Um, ultimately, I think having signed up to the Zero Carbon Act, uh, the government is going to be forced to confront the reality of the trade offs between different projects we could be investing in. And so there's there's really huge potential. So in addition to the ERP, I'll just give you a little plug for the let's get well moving if you're in Wellington, uh, definitely submit on that. And uh, the Greens have a page with a submission guide where we're recommending option four as the most um, climate friendly option, the one that gives us the most opportunity in the future to invest more in regional rapid rail or better public transport solutions in other parts of the city. Um, and it's also the one that would enable us to get on with rapid transit being light rail to Island Bay, which does a lot for housing and reducing emissions. Um, all the other options require spending $1.4 billion to extend some lanes in a tunnel under the basin before you even invest in rapid transit, which seems crazy to me. Um, and uh, yeah, just your voice is really important. Um, I guess having a majority Labour government, even though it's great that we have a Minister for Climate Change that's green, and that does matter because he helps influence um, the Sorry, I don't know if you can hear a toddler screaming in the background. <laughs> only vaguely, only Big vaguely. drama at our house. Um, um, I'm almost done. Um, yeah, with the Labour majority government, um, we need to influence public opinion as much as possible so that they feel empowered to make the changes that need to be made. Um, so we've set up the infrastructure with the Zero Carbon Act. I think that's really useful, uh, but now we need to use that to push for much more effective change so that we actually can uh, pull our weight in the world in the uh, fight to you know, keep global warming under 1.5 degrees and create healthier, happier communities with more affordable and fun transport options. Sure, sure Julianne. Um, thank you both for uh, joining us and for your time this, uh, this evening. And for your wisdom we really appreciate it um just a, a few very brief closing remarks from my point of view well thanks to everybody for joining and thanks to everybody who's um who's been on facebook as well and this will be recorded so um you know for you watching it later thanks for watching it later too the the transport section of the emissions reduction plan that we are encouraging you to submit on and i'm sure you will submit on it's the best section by far of that document. It is the most well thought out, it has the best um, set of policies. Um, so we're, it's a good start. And one thing I, I kind of feel as somebody who works on transport in my job is the loss mentality. A lot of people think that they're gonna lose things in the transition to transport, but, but we're not. We're gonna get a whole bunch of great things as Julianne and Tiano have said. We're gonna open up the streets for more people to use. We can do it with universal design. So everybody, regardless of uh, whether they're a disabled person or not, will be able to use and access all of these great new spaces. Public transport is great because it's it's a collective thing. Yesterday I got the bus home uh, and uh, my friend was on there and then my friend's friend got on and then they got off and then they were like, hey, should we get off together? 
at, at a stop and you know go for a beer in Hatata and they did and it was great. So there's a there's a collective aspect to the transport changes that we're going to get that we shouldn't we shouldn't forget as well. Um, so with that, please do submit. There's lots of good links there in the chat. There's links on the um, on the Facebook page for the event as well. And I'll just close us off with a, with a brief cut here as well. Me and my tato. Te whakaia tanga ia. Te whakaia tanga ia. Tēne te kaupapa ka ia. Tēne te wānanga ka ia. Te mauri o te kaupapa ka whakamoia. Te mauri o te wānanga ka whakamoia. Kua ki runga, kua ki raro, haumie huie, tāikie. Kia ora everyone, pō marie.